All right, welcome back to the Shades of Blue Soccer Show, not a podcast, I guess, a vlog or whatever the hell they call that, whatever they call this that we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> with, with me today, I have Coach John Pascarella, head coach of the Oklahoma City Energy, former assistant coach slash goalkeeper coach for Sporting Kansas City, Minnesota United, a couple other places that I don't really care about. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm, that's a demeanum. Just, uh, so anyway, John, Coach, JP, how you doing, man? Doing great, Fab. Thanks for, for having me on, and it's great to reconnect with you. The last couple of months have been a little tough on everybody. How, how, how are you and the family? Let's, let's get that part out of the way. Me, me and the family are well. I've actually been, I'm back in Minnesota right now. I'm, I left OKC just a couple of days ago to come home to take care of some personal business and figured now with it kind of being the off season, was the best time to, to get it done. Um, so I'm here for, I think, two more days, and then I'll head back to OKC. We'll start training, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yes. So to answer your question, the family's doing great. Um, it's nice to see them again because I've seen my wife once since I left January 5th and hadn't seen the children at all. Um, everybody's home. Some of the kids are home from college. It's, it's cool to have everybody back. So we've enjoyed it. Are you, you going to bring them down there to Oklahoma City with you over the summer? Um, my, my son definitely will come for the summer. He's going to train and get ready for his freshman season at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm sure my girls will come down occasionally just to visit. Same with my wife. But the intention was to have them move possibly this summer. Yeah. And COVID and everything else that's happened, it's kind of put it on the back burner right now. So we may actually have to wait till Christmas or go through another school year before we can get the whole family out. Um, but it's a process. We've been through it before, and they've always been very good uh, about that. They always tend to be one or two states behind. <laughs> they finally catch up to me, then I get the next job, and I'm off somewhere else, and then they eventually catch up. And it's been that way for quite a while now. Yeah, I know how that goes. Uh, yeah, I remember meeting your wife. I mean, I've met all your family at one point, but your wife was really nice. I remember I told her a story about you, and she slapped you. <laughs> Not surprising. Uh, all in good humor. Um, yeah, I know it's uh, always so interesting how coaches and players have to deal with this sort of thing. And, you know, former military guy, I kind of had that experience too. Of course, I didn't really have a family at that point, so it didn't matter as much. Yeah, it's been, an, it's been an interesting, I mean, it's been an interesting journey, the whole coaching thing, you know, with having to uproot and move a few times and, and the family having to, to follow behind. Thank goodness they are very supportive. I've been lucky. Um, especially with my wife, but it's been that way for, for 27 years now. So she's kind of used to it. it yeah. it's, it's always tougher sometimes on the kids, um, but they've, they've done really well with it all. They're well adjusted and they've, you know, there's four of them. So I think they, they find themselves to be their own little army wherever they go and, and they've seemed to enjoy it. So they make friends pretty quickly. Uh, I think, I think your, your whole family probably does that sort of make friends kind of quickly yeah we're we're all kind of outgoing and personable that way yep um I, I, not thinking about the time but you said you've been married for 27 years were you married when you were still playing like uh right at the end yeah it was yeah i met my wife when i was playing in dc uh i was with the washington stars at the time this was in uh whoo 88 maybe 89 yeah. um so that's when I met her. I was playing. I ended up leaving, going to Peru, and then coming back. Went back a couple times, actually, and played there, and then played with the Galaxy. So she was with me for four or five years as a player before going into the coaching. And she was actually the one that had recommended me trying coaching. Sasha Shirovsky had asked me um, if I wanted to get involved with Maryland's program, and I kept saying no, and I, I really had no interest in coaching at the time. Could barely be responsible enough for myself, let alone other people. And eventually my wife said, maybe it's something you should try. You may not get the opportunity down the road. And, uh, and so I did. And now she's been chasing me from state to state ever since. Well, she seems like a, a wonderful person. Uh, when you yes. did get into coaching, how big, I mean, to me, there's always like that, that first step of doing something different, you know, mm -hmm. having to adapt um, mm -hmm. where you've learned what somebody's done before and things like that and trying to bring that with you. How was that first step into coaching? It was, um, it was awesome, actually, because I, you know, for an example, I gave Sasha uh, a year where I said I would do this for a year and try it. Um, I was almost embarrassed at the end of that year to tell him how much I loved it. So I ended up going back for another two. Um, 
so it, it, it is challenging and it, it's, it's a change because you're used to as an athlete being worried about yourself and focusing on yourself. And when you're coaching, it's not about you at all. It's about everything and everyone else. And they all come first before your own needs. And that was something I was worried about that, at that time because I was newly married, um, still a fairly selfish person, self-centered, only worried about myself in the context of my career and where I was going. And so it took some adjusting, but Sasha was a great mentor, um, recommended that I start going to, to coaching schools and, and going through the licensing process and started reading and studying more management and psychology and, and child development and all that stuff. And eventually, you know, really kind of fell in love with the, with the profession. It is a big change when you go from being single to married, when you go from being a player to a coach, when you go from being a worker to a manager, you know, being a leader, you now have to look at everybody else and find ways for them to succeed better than yourself sometimes. Correct. Correct. It's, it's always about others. And it's interesting. One of, the, one of the most interesting things people have taught me about leadership is that, you know, when things really bad happen to your team, it's really important to make sure you're looking in the mirror. When things really, really good happen to your team, make sure that you're looking out the window and saying, hey, they're the reason why. Those guys over there, they're the reason why we're so successful. Um, and as a player, yes, you buy into the team concept, but you're, you're focused on yourself and your career. As a coach, that mentality entirely changes. Um, and what's funny is I've, I have found it to be um, really a natural extension of my personality. It, my way of handling the players and managing the players and dealing with them and building the relationships isn't much different than the way I deal with my own children, with yeah. my wife, with some of my closest friends. Because the biggest thing that the players need to feel is the trust from me. And I need to build their trust. If they don't trust me and I don't trust them, we're, we're done. So that's, that's really a big factor in, in what we do. And and, and I think, luckily, my personality helps that a little bit, the ability to want to communicate and to talk and the willingness to do that. So, um, But it's, it's been an interesting transition for sure. When, uh, when you first came to the Wizards at the time, and you know, I could go to practice a lot back then. They, they've cut that way down now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'd stand there and just listen and watch. And I always loved how you were just – you were always talking to the, the players, to the keepers, do this, do this, and uh, – praising them or if they screwed something up, you might say something, but you do it in a joking manner. So it was very lighthearted. And mm -hmm. not, I mean, you may have gotten after a couple people here and there, but it was mostly always trying to be upbeat and, and keep them going upwards, not down. It, it, it is. I would say that in terms of my philosophy and my coaching style, it is much more positive than it is in negative. I try to pick on the things they do really well and emphasize those things. Yes. As a coach, you've got to focus on some of the negatives and you've got to clean those things up. Um, but I think they always respond better when you're picking on the positive. So um, but my players have certainly gotten used to being corrected at times as well. So it's, it's an interesting mix, you know, and, and trying to build that trust and, and build a team that's really a reflection of you. How much did that change when you went from being primarily a keeper coach slash assistant to being the head coach? Now, does that, does that change at all or just a little more all encompassing or? I don't, I don't think my relationship with the players um, and my dealing with them has changed much at all. What's changed more than anything is that within the discussions with the team or the staff, I'm no longer the person giving opinions um, or pushing my point of view or perspective. I'm now the one seeking everybody else's perspective and opinion and then evaluating those in conjunction with my own and trying to make the best decision possible for the group. That's not something that um, I had a lot of practice in. My job with Peter, my job with Adrian Heath in Minnesota was primarily to give feedback and my thoughts, my ideas, and my opinions. And then the head coaches take what they want from that and they use it. And what they don't want, they discard and, and you move on. Those, those roles have flip-flop a little bit for me now. I've got a staff that helps me with that. I make sure I solicit all their opinions and, and get as much perspective as I can because I know that, that our four heads together are going to be better than just mine alone. So it's a, it's a little bit of give and take, and, uh, and it's been an interesting process to go through with them. It's, um, I guess that for me, I've always, for every person I've ever worked for, I've always tried to learn something from them, sometimes a positive, sometimes not to be this sort of mm -hmm. thing. 
can you give a, a something you've learned from both Peter and Adrian? Yeah, I mean they're they're similar in some ways, and they're and they're both very different. Um, the biggest thing I learned from Peter, and, and I've known Peter for a long time. We go back well before um, I started working for him in Kansas City. Um, the thing I took from Pete that I still I find myself doing more and more now is there, there's a difference between, and you have to make sure you understand the difference between the relationship with the person and the player. You can have a great relationship with the person and respect them and treat them well even though sometimes you don't think they can do the job on the field. And those are difficult things sometimes to, to work through in your own head because you're in your own mind rooting for a guy to, to succeed, hoping that he can turn the corner, all those things, and you're trying to help him do that. But at the same time, you've got to make sure you're putting your team in the best position to win. And sometimes that means sacrificing that relationship or that person's feelings for the group. Um, and that's not easy when you're an emotional person, but it's something that, that Peter made sure that he, in his own way, uh, made me understand that this is an important piece of the job. You've got to be able to separate your feelings for the person and your, and your feelings for the player. So he never gave that to me in a lesson where he sat down and said, you have to be able to do this. But it's things I took from him on a day-to-day -day basis um, in that environment that has, that has helped me. Um, in my new job. And it's obviously helped Peter have such a strong program and he constantly knows how to turn over that team and let the next guy go, even though he might be well loved or well respected. You let the next guy go and you bring in new blood and you keep the team fresh and you look at the success that's brought to Kansas City, you know? Um, with Adrian, it was a little bit different and it's, it's not a negative, um, but as my, from my perspective, having been with sporting, and a very strong and solid defensive team, or, or defensively strong. I wouldn't say we were a defensive team, but we were very defensively strong, and we emphasize that. Plus, my background is a goalkeeper, which is a little more defensive in perspective. Adrian was all about training the attacking side of the game. And we didn't work a lot when I initially got there on the defensive side of the game. Mark Watson, who was, was really Adrian's right-hand man, and myself, always had to try to keep that balance in check and make sure that we spoke with him about having to set aside time to work on our shape and our functional defending and making sure we understood our roles and responsibilities in that phase of the game. So I've made sure, or I've tried to make sure anyway, that I have a more balanced approach working with my team. Can we attack? Can we defend? Can we transition between those two phases? I, I want it to be a, a little more of a, of a holistic program. To be fair, I think Adrian um, actually, because he, he sought our perspectives on things, um, changed a little bit and added more and more defensive structure to our training and to our team. And over time, that helped us over that second, uh, second year late and then in the third year making the, uh, making the playoffs. So it's, you know, you take things from every single person you've ever worked with, worked for, coaches you've had in the past, relationships you've had, you take these little bits and pieces and you try to use them within your own personality and your own philosophy to make yourself and your group better. Oh, absolutely. Were you, were you instrumental in helping uh, get uh, the trade for Ike? No comment. <laughs> no comment or it might be misconstrued as tampering. Um, but no, no, yeah, yeah. It's, Let's not get anybody in trouble. It, no, it's, it's just an interesting thing because – there's, there's tampering in all sports, all professional sports. Not mean it's right, meaning it, it, it's the, the existence of it is there and people are aware of it. Um, but by the same token, we're all humans working in an industry that's pressure packed and there's no way to survive it but forming strong bonds and relationships with the people that you're going through that with. Right. So if I'm in Sporting Kansas City for eight years or I'm in Minnesota for two years, I think it's pretty natural to develop a relationship with people that extends outside of the game or extends outside of your time there. So if I've left Kansas City, but I continue to talk to Tim Melia or Graham Zussi or Matt Beasler or whoever it happens to be, it's because we're now friendly off the field. There's a relationship there. Right. But that can really be misconstrued as tampering. Because yeah, why yeah. coach of another team talking to a player from a team you've been with in the past? 
but really it's human nature. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely didn't mean it in that sort of vein of the tampering thing, more is just that you knew Ike and knew what he could bring to Minnesota. Oh yeah. That like, hey, Adrian, hey, yeah. let's make this deal. We know, I know what he can do to help solidify the defense. That's yeah. Definitely well, not I've tampering. Couple, I, yeah, I've had a couple people mention about the tampering thing. That's why I bring it up because I'm close with the people in Kansas City. Right. You know, every once in a while you talk to someone in the organization like, how did you get Ike? You know? <laughs> um, but, but really the reality is how did we get Ike? Um, one, I think he felt comfortable coming there. Uh, because he knew some people that were already there, uh, a couple guys on the coaching staff. Two, his fiance at that time, who's now his wife, has family in Minneapolis. Yeah. So that move made all the sense in the world to him. And then I think at the time, he was also going through a negotiation process with his contract. And so if it wasn't going to work there, hey, we could use some help in central defense. Yeah, it definitely worked out for you guys. Yeah, worked out great for us. Worked out for him as well. Another yeah. defender in the year honor. Yeah, no. When when he's healthy, he is one of the best for sure. Yes, but that's yes, when I, I, a great, great person. And it's probably past the point we need to qualify it with when healthy, because there for a while that was always yeah. the question. Like every time yes. he went down on the ground, every the whole crowd went, you know, paused and okay, he's getting up good. Yeah, yeah. Everybody would hold their breath. But what a great person. I mean, to go through what he went through because I saw it up close and personal. When he had the microfracture surgery on his foot after the injury in Colorado, fought and fought and fought to come back and was healthy as a horse and playing again. And a few weeks, maybe, I can't even remember, was it five, six weeks into his coming back and playing and starting again? And he ends up injuring the other Achilles and now he's out for another year. I don't know a lot of people, I haven't met a lot of people that have had to face that type of adversity in their profession and fought through it and fought through it because that's literally two years of your career and yep. your life where your team is working in one area and you're sweating and bleeding by yourself in another just trying to get back to join the, the group so got a, i've got a lot of respect for for him and for people that can do stuff like that and he's had some even before that and yeah. then uh, like the concussion Concussions. from uh, yeah so it's he's he's definitely the guy who when he goes down you know he's going to get back up he's proved it time and time again at this point yes yeah. Uh, now that you're in Oklahoma, OKC, um, and like you said, the, you're, you're going to get to start training again here shortly. I think small mm -hmm. groups, USL approved small groups. Um, can you tell, what can you tell me about the energy? What's, what are you doing with those guys? I know there's a couple former Kansas City guys there from, mm -hmm. from Kansas City, yep. not supporting KC, but from the academy maybe. Yep, yep. So we've got some young kids there. Um, that have been involved from sport in Kansas City. Uh, Tucker Stevenson is one of them. Ray Sari, a Kansas City kid who didn't come through our academy, but ironically, Ray is the kid who in our very first game in what was then called Livestrong Park mm -hmm. in the cancer seat because he was a youth soccer player that had survived cancer in Kansas City. Um, and so he's the first player uh, or first person that we had sit in that special seat um in the stadium so we've got a couple kansas city kids um i put together a team where i was very lucky as i took over the group they only had eight returning players actually they only had seven returning players at the time and all players that, that i liked players that i i knew in the usl for both peter in kansas city and for adrian in minnesota i did a lot of scouting of the usl so i had a pretty good idea of some of the better players and players I liked in that league and players I thought that could play um, in uh, playing MLS. So I went out and tried to find guys that I not only liked as players, but then did some digging into their character, into their personalities and tried to put together a team that had some grit um, because I think we're going to need it. It's, this is not a team that made the playoffs last year. They don't change coaches when teams are doing really well. They generally change coaches when a team isn't successful. Right. So I've been lucky enough to have eight players from last year that I like and think are good players. Uh, I added another 16 on top of that. All players that I've had discussions with in the past. Some I've brought into train in Kansas City when they were in college or into Minnesota United. These are all players that in some way, shape, or form I was connected to for the most part and therefore trusted. Knew that I could trust the character of the person as well as the quality of the soccer player. So we're trying to put together that kind of group, one that reflects um, what I feel is important to me, which is being a solid citizen 
and being a very good and smart soccer player. Uh, so that's what we're trying to build there. And we're trying to play the game um, somewhat similar to the way Kansas City plays in terms of a, a possession-based game and trying to build through the thirds. I eventually want to make it a team that's tactically flexible and understands different scenarios and times and places. But that doesn't happen overnight. No. I, I literally had the group for five weeks, played a game, a game where I thought we actually played fairly well, lost the game on an own goal, two to one. Um, but in terms of the performance, for a first performance after five weeks of training, I was pretty happy with. So it's moving in the right direction, but then unfortunately it all kind of got cut. And now preseason number two will start here shortly, I think, for, uh, for 2020, because you'll kind of build on, uh, on your early start this year. But, you know, you're, you're starting over, really. Yeah, and this year is going to be uh, – it's going to be interesting to see just even how many games are played and what formats they're played in and, no. um, you know, how do you even judge the performance on, in certain things for this year. So it's going to be just a very uh, – upside down year of how things work uh, yeah. were, you able to yeah, do any, were, were you able to do any work with the team I mean I know you couldn't do drill you couldn't do practices and things like that but could you keep in communication with them and talk about how you wanted to play or did you need to give them their space and just let them be at this point uh initially after it first happened I let every everything kind of run its course with people's emotions and I kept in touch with everyone for that first week to 10 days um, but we really didn't do anything till we could kind of see what it looked like. What did the landscape look like? What's going to happen? Is this going to be a couple of weeks or does this look like it's going to be a couple of months? And you could quite quickly realize within that first week or two, hey, this is going to be a while. Right. Um, and so we've established a schedule where we're together three or four times a week on Zoom, either going through team workouts and interval sessions where guys are doing, you know, 45 seconds of burpees and then they're resting and then they're doing the next activity and then resting. And it's not the same as playing. Um, and we've let the players lead it. So each a player takes a turn in leading it and they work with one of my assistant coaches to make sure that physiologically the workout makes sense. Some have incorporated the ball, some haven't. Um, so we're staying connected emotionally that way. We've picked apart on video the opening game and kind of looked at different phases and different things and talked about it in the, in the context of our model of play and hey the ball's now here with our right back let's freeze this what are your options what are you looking for here's the time and place in the game here's the context of the moment tell me what you were thinking tell me what you were feeling and then we we talk about that that action or that moment in the game so we've had a lot of that going on recently uh, we've had great participation in it, which has been fantastic. Uh, we've had very little um, of the players leaving the market. The league has asked the players, can you stay in market? We think it would be healthier for you to do that. One or two have had to go in emergency situations, but primarily the group has stayed together. Um, and they feel comfortable together. They feel safe within the confines of each other because they've pretty much lived together and hung out together um, this entire time. Two thirds of our team, live in the same apartment complex. Um, and many of them live together. Some of the ones that aren't living together are living with their spouses and their kids in that same apartment complex. So um, we're all, we see each other, you're waving to the guys, you're on Zoom all the time. We've managed to keep it pretty good. I'll be curious how it works once we all get back together face-to-face -to -face in, in training again. Yeah, I, it, one of the kind of dumb thoughts that ran through my head was, you know, I wonder if it's almost a a little bit better for uh, a USL team, for example, than maybe an MLS team where not, very few of those MLS guys are going to be living together just because of the salary differences and stuff where the USL guys, you know, hey, they might have two, three, four guys in an apartment. They can still go practice together. They can still Correct. work out together. So. Correct. We'd actually seen a few um, little snippets on, on Twitter or somewhere where you see four or five of your guys out in the park all playing and taking pictures and posing and dabbing and doing all – all their things and they're enjoying one another's company and they're playing, you know, and, and that's great. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It is the one way that they can keep in touch with, with the ball and the game a little bit, because that's been, uh, that's been the hardest piece here. But uh, it's in the, in the kind of the long run, it might benefit with uh, some of the bonding that they went through. It's been a collective experience together now. Correct. Yeah. And that's, yeah. That's a lot of times that collective experience is what builds that bond and 
and camaraderie that makes a team fight for each other. Correct. Correct. You have that, that common thing that happened that you all rally around. Um, now, unfortunately, the entire league can go and do that same thing. Um, and that's what will be interesting when we all come back to play is which organizations in MLS, which organizations in the USL were best able to take advantage of this break? Yep. Who became creative? Who were able to innovate different ideas or things that can help keep your team prospering and keeping your team growing and, and moving towards their goal of ultimately being champions? You know, so be curious which organizations did well with that piece of it and which didn't. Hopefully we'll be one of the ones that did well. Uh, I have faith in you, Coach, that you will probably be one of those guys just based on your experience and yeah. your positive attitude. Well, thank um, you. I'm also convinced that sporting will probably come out of it in a positive manner also with how they work. No doubt. No doubt. As, as regimented as they are about doing things, Peter will have every policy and pr procedure in place and understand how to use that to his advantage to make his team better mentally stronger, technically, tactically better. I, I expect sporting to come out of this thing flying. Oh, yeah. that's um, Peter has been very heavily involved in the implementing the processes for mm -hmm. the, the, the league to come back and yep. also heavily working on the development academy because of the U.S. soccer dropping the development academy stuff. So it, he's been very heavily involved in all of that. So he, I know he's been still extremely busy. Yeah. Uh, and, have you been able to use that time for your betterment or you've been then watching stuff? Or? Yeah, um, I, I've done a lot of work in terms of studying. I, I think like a lot of coaches, I've been jumping on webinars. Um, I've always been an avid reader. And so I, I took stacks of books with me um, that I hadn't finished reading that I wanted to read into Oklahoma City. They're all done. And I've had to order another dozen books off of Amazon about two weeks ago, and some have come in and some haven't yet. So I'm, I'm trying to find areas where I'm not quite as good yet as I want to be. And, and, and really, it's all areas. I'm, I'm still reading up on management and leadership. I still read on psychology. I still read about the development of teams. All these things are, are important for me because of the business that I'm in. And if the more I learn, and try to use some of these principles. And it's not haphazardly applying them. Some of them you read and you go, yeah, that's, that's not me. And then other ones you read and go, that, that feels like me. It feels genuine and authentic to me. And you try and implement some of these little things that, that you, you're, you're reading and studying. So yes, I'm trying to get better every single day. Um, that is another thing that, that Peter and Sporting, the organization, has drilled into me. You know, Listen, don't rest on your laurels. We are constantly trying to get better so yeah. maybe we'll use this time to do it oh yeah that's uh i've been trying to learn a few new things too so good not always easy but no no especially listen dad it, it, it's funny as you get older you become a little bit more conservative it's yeah. hard to it, it's harder to try to do something new where now as an adult you're somewhat successful but you know that new thing is going to bring some failure and it's really good, I think, some ways to, to be that way and to have that beginner's mind again because you realize what players are going through sometimes when you're asking them to, to change or to do something that's different than what they did on their last team. So it, it brings me uh, some perspective as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not too afraid of failure because, I mean, again, I'm willing to ask the dumb questions. I'm willing to try <laughs> these different things. It's always been my strength is that I'm willing to try and right. figure things out. And yeah. I that's know great with – with, uh, with trying anything new, you're going to fail X amount of times before it becomes mm -hmm. successful. And then you're probably going to fail another Y amount of times before it's successful the second time. Right. Um, so even just for me, like I'm, I'm a photographer. I'm been trying to do more video stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you're learning and you're growing from it as you're doing it, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I do one and then a week later I have to relearn everything I just did the week before. <laughs> but It'll become automated and it'll become habit. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, I know I'm not too worried about it. It's just a slow process sometimes. Right. Sometimes it's it's, it's that is the right mentality. But understand, there's not a lot of people with that mentality, Dad. Unfortunately, that's true. A lot of people want to just make it work. Yeah. It have to be perfect the first time. Or, yeah. I, uh, I live in a house with a couple of people who want to be perfect. 
And when it's not there, they sometimes get upset. I'm not going to mention my wife's name or my daughter's name. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, they're both extremely talented and wonderful people, so they don't fail a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that resilience and that grit that people have to, to really learn. That's, that's what's fun about being in this industry. You know, the reason why the players have gotten to where they are yep. is because they have that resilience and that grit. They're determined. They're not going to take no for an answer. They've had coaches say to them before, hey, you're not good enough. And in their own heads, they've said, oh, I'll show you. And yep. so they go out and they get better and they prove it. And that's, that's an interesting group to work with. I've, I've noticed before, like uh, some players, and I mean, I watched this through youth soccer and up through high school. You have players who are naturally, their ability is way above everybody else and they're not mm -hmm. challenged. Once mm -hmm. they get to a certain level, they get to high school or to college or to a pro team. Now they're, everybody else is that talented or more. And they fail because they've never had to keep growing. They've always been better. Right. They've never dealt with that adversity of not being the best player, not being one of the best players. Whereas now they're at the bottom of the pecking order. And this happens so much in American soccer now because the difference between the college game and the pro game, yeah. that, that gap has grown even larger. So there's even fewer guys that can initially make that step from the college game right into the pro game. Sometimes it's hard for them even to make that step into the USL game. Um, but it, it's, it's persistence, it's resilience, it's, it's that stick to itness that, uh, that they have that helps them rise to the top and allows them to stay in this profession. That, uh, that, gra that gap is going to continue to grow, in, at least in my opinion, because more development academies, like, I mean, a lot of the USL teams now have development academies. Does OKC have one? We had it for the girls' side. We did not have DA approved yet for the boys' side. That was one of the things that I was trying to work on to see if we couldn't develop the right curriculum, the right staff, the right processes to bring it to Oklahoma City. But very quickly after I got there, we, we got word that this was, going to, um, this was going to fall away and that there was going to be a new process involved. So I've already started working with USL. Um, in fact, it's a former sporting guy, uh, Liam O'Connell. Yeah. And Liam is now with the USL League office and works on the academy side, trying to bring academies to all of the USL teams. Was one of the major contributors to this year's, I don't know what they called it, but maybe the USL Academy Cup or something. They've got this yeah. new thing going on. So they're trying to expand that whole thing now with the disbanding of the, the DA. They want to try and, and maybe become the, the premier development academy system in the U.S. for soccer. So we'll see. I'm not sure it's, it's the right way to go in America. I had some, some issues with the way we did it here. Uh, but I think that if you provide the right environment and the right platform for it, you can, you can really make it run well. Yeah, it's, again, with, with everything that's going on in the world, there, that's just one more change that's going to come to soccer is I know MLS is trying to develop its own development academy league that will involve other academies, you know, non-MLS academies. So that would, you know, the unaffiliated academies, and I would assume USL academies if they so choose. But I know mm -hmm. USL is doing an academy system, and I don't understand how all that will fit together, but I don't think anybody understands how that's all going to fit together yet. Correct. I think you still have people that want to make sure they're protecting their, their piece of the pie. Um, and if we can get rid of a little bit of that mentality and get people working together, which is not an easy thing to do, we might be able to get one good holistic program. If not, it might be piecemeal again for a little while. And, and, and maybe that's not such a bad way to go, provided that each one of those little sections is doing a decent job of developing. Maybe that's a good way to go. So I'm not sure. I don't have the answers to that. And that's probably why I'm not involved in high levels of U.S. soccer. Not yet. Not yet, Coach. <laughs> yeah, not yet. All right. Well, well, we'll give you a few years for that. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the uh, next assistant coach to the national team and then the next head coach after that. Let's just hope I can be successful in the role I'm in now. So uh, I have faith that you will. I'll grow into that, and I'll learn from that, and then we'll see where that takes us. But, um, just out of curiosity, did you talk to Jimmy when you decided to take that job to see what his experience was? I, I mean, I'm sure you guys are – still talk once in a while? We do. We do still talk once in a while. Um, I not only spoke to Jimmy about the organization, and I have for years, because even when Jimmy was coaching down there, I, I 
helped keep, I don't want to say the relationship alive, but I was the one that was tightest with Jason and Jimmy, Jason Hawkins being the, um, the GM there. I ended up meeting a bunch of people uh, in their front office, which, which now helps me and is to my benefit because we're all more comfortable with one another. But I did seek his advice. And I also, in many ways, sought his blessing or permission. I called him when things were coming very close to being done and wanted to make sure, and I thought it would be okay, but I wanted to make sure that he was completely comfortable with me taking that job in the way that, especially in the way that he had left that job, because he'd had some really good success, but he'd had some issues with some of the people in the front office. Right. And what I didn't want to lose was a fantastic relationship that I'd had with him over a job. I could have gotten another job, you know what I mean? But as it was, Jimmy was Jimmy and looked at me and said, listen, you do your thing, man. You got a team there, go coach your team, have fun, enjoy it. Um, so he has been, he's been very, very good in terms of giving me a little bit of the lay of the land of the organization, as well as the freedom to feel comfortable to take the job and to do my thing. I think that speaks very highly of both you and Jimmy in this case of the way you handle that sort of thing. I mm -hmm. could not see Jimmy ever telling you, no, don't do it because it would insult me. He might say, hey, this is the problems there, but he wouldn't tell you not to do it because he didn't like it. Right. But you having the respect that you want to make sure your friend is okay with that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Listen, I think everybody, everybody in Kansas City knows this. Jimmy and his family know it. My family know it for sure. I love the guy. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not embarrassed to say it. When you go through those common experiences that we talked about earlier, and we had some common experiences over the years that he was in Kansas City, when you go through that stress and, and you know, fighting and banging your head against the wall against Houston and then finally breaking through and then winning MLS Cups and having some open cups, all those things brings you very close together. And when you grind day in and day out with people like him, good people like him, those relationships you want to last. So he's somebody that I try to keep very, very close to me. Yeah, he's, he's, he's still one of my favorite players. The, the fan side of me, he's one of my favorite players of all time. Um, yeah. The media side of me, he's one of my favorite players because of how bluntly honest he was. Yeah. He was, after a game, win or lose, he was standing there at his chair when the media would come into the locker room and answer every question and be honest about how the team played. He didn't yeah. sugarcoat it. He didn't, he didn't take credit. He did all the right things as a leader. And I yeah. think he was great about that. And, and the word you use there, leader, is absolutely right. He was an excellent leader for our locker room and for our team. He was also an excellent leader when he went to, to OKC as a coach. It's just who he is. It's what he does. He leads. He's got that personality that draws people towards him and they follow him. Yeah, and he's, he's one of the people who can be honest about how like the team played and still yeah. be positive about how they can play. Does that make right. sense? Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a, a tough question at you now. Okay. You've, you've coached Jimmy. You've coached him. You've coached uh, Kevin Hartman before that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've been around long enough to see some of the other keepers that Kansas City's had in the past, like Tony Miola, and, and we'll throw Bo Ashoni in there. Mm -hmm. um, who, I, I'm going to throw, of those five, who's the best keeper that Kansas City's ever had? You know, you're in a bad spot, I know. No, it doesn't put me in a bad spot at all, really. I mean, it's listen, you do this every day as a coach, don't you? You got to make picks and selections. Um, I, for me, the, the two that stand out above, above the rest would be Jimmy and Tony. The thing that's unfair for me to say is, one I worked with day in and day out and have a very good feel for what he could do and what he brought to the team, both physically, technically, tactically, all that stuff, but also in terms of a leader. I don't have a good feel for how Tony did that. I know some stories. I've heard some things from Peter because they played together. He would probably, Peter would probably be the absolute best person to be able to tell you which of those guys, because he spent so much time there as a player and a coach. For me, Jimmy and Tony would be, would be up there above anybody else, head and shoulders above anybody else. And for me, because of that working relationship and how, how, Intimately, I know his game and how he led. It would have to be Jimmy Nielsen. What's Tim got to do to, to get up there? Does he need to win a cup? Um, I think that would probably be the biggest thing. And listen, Tim's been huge for that organization. He's been huge in regular season games, in playoff games, in open cup games. Remember, 
I was there once when we won an open cup with Tim in a penalty kick shootout as well. So it's not like he hasn't been clutch uh, in those moments as well in Philadelphia. So um, what does he have to do? You know, maybe it's just a matter of him retiring and then all of us appreciating more what he had brought to, to the group. Tim is, Tim is fantastic for the team um, and in many ways fits the way the team has developed better than Jimmy did. At that time, the way we were playing, the one drawback to Jimmy's game was his inability to play a lot with his feet. He right. wasn't comfortable playing. You know, he was part of the, the end of that generation that, that didn't really have that in their game. They didn't have to grow up as a younger player playing a ton with their feet. Um, if you look at Tim, Tim's better with his feet. And I think uh, Alec Dufty's done an unbelievable job of making him even better. So now Tim's not just proficient with his feet, he's actually quite good and can pick a pass, whether it's a diagonal ball into midfield or whether it's a little entry ball into, into one of the players. He's, he's very good at playing those balls now. So they've done a great job with him. I think that that, that part of his game is developing but I still think he has a little ways to go to be able to reach that level of a, of a Jimmy Nielsen or, um, or Tony Miola. No, no. The interesting thing is um, to me, like Bo was, he's probably been one of the most overlooked guys in Kansas city just because he, he had some good time and then he had some not so good time, but he had, he was really good for a little while. Uh, but Hartman was one of the league's best keepers for years. I mean, led mm -hmm. the league in, in all kinds of stats and people hated the fact that he was leaving when they were bringing in Jimmy Nielsen, but that yeah. was that quickly changed. The you know people fell in love with Jimmy. Yeah, interesting how that happens. By the way, huh? We love you. We love you. We love you. Oh, you're gone. We love the new guy. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the king is dead. Hail to the king. So it's that's just the way it goes. You know, he um, he Kevin was outstanding for us. Unfortunately, he was in Kansas City at a time where the team was kind of ebbing and flowing yeah. and looking for more consistency. And he was in a contract year and asking probably for more money. And I don't know what that number was because I wasn't in negotiations, but probably asking for more money than the organization wanted to, to deal with. Or maybe it was a longer term contract than they wanted to deal with. I'm not sure. All I know is I was tasked with the responsibility of going out and finding a goalkeeper, whether it was domestic or international, that we thought could be successful in, uh, in Kansas City. And I think we did a good job in, in bringing in Jimmy Nielsen. Oh, yeah, he definitely did. Um, and, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I questioned the, the move at the time. I'm like, why bring in a foreign keeper? There's so many good American keepers. Yeah. America was known for having good keepers for a long yep. time. Yep. Like, why do that? And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd almost go with a young guy, considering the team wasn't that good at the time, and let him develop. Mm -hmm. But, hey, it worked out really, really well. So. Yeah, worked out nicely. If I'm... If I remember right, and I could could be wrong, but uh, if I remember right, Hartman and Kronberg both had the same agent at the time, and they were both out of contract, so the team had no keepers officially. They were both asking for something that the team didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And I actually, if I remember right, and I could be wrong, but I want to say Hartman was asking for a shorter contract, not a longer contract. Maybe, maybe I, I couldn't say because I don't, I don't, and, and I don't want to put you on a bad spot, even if you did know. But yeah, I'm trying yeah. to remember. No, the one thing I can tell you about that time is it, it was interesting because we felt like Kronberg was ready and had the opportunity to step in for Kevin. And he actually ended up in some ways killing himself, yep. holding out and, and listening to his agent because we ended up bringing in Jimmy. Crony sat really behind Jimmy for another few years, then finally got his shot. And when he did, it didn't work out well enough. And then we, we moved on from there. Yeah. And I, I feel bad for, for him because I thought he was a good keeper. And he was. when uh, even the year when he really got his shot, he was doing well until he got injured. And if I remember right, he probably came back a little sooner than he should have. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was needed. I don't remember the situation there. But then he had a string of bad games when he first came back from his injury. And that kind of just sealed the deal, let's move on kind of thing at that point. So it was, it was him and uh, Andy Grenabon at the time. They were going back and forth. And what was interesting right. was one would get injured. The other one would step in. He'd do okay for a while. Then he'd get injured. The next guy would come back. He'd step back in. And it kind of was a revolving door that season where Crony was the last man standing at the end. 
and we ended up losing the playoff game to Red Bull in New York on a goal that was late in the game that really was a, a shit goal, but yeah. not on his part, but by the entire defense. The, the whole action was really a bad goal, um, but it was kind of the last straw, and so we moved on at that point. Yeah, and, and sometimes even when it's not the player's fault, you got to move on just to have a new fresh start for both the team and the player. So that's correct. understandable. Correct. Right? In, that yeah. in fact, I think he's now I think he's now in the league or in the USL coaching with Portland, either their their two team or with their first team. I'm not sure which, but the coaching staff, some of the guys from Portland, called me not too long ago before the season started and asked about him and my relationship with him and what yeah. I could tell him about him. I think he ended up with that job. Yeah, no, I I think you're right. I think he's coaching. I just don't remember where. <coughs> yeah, I more think, power to him. Good. I, I, he's another one of those guys I really liked. I just didn't, yeah didn't, Good didn't work out at the time. Um, curious. So okay, you know, you always get asked when you talk to people from your old places. You know, what's the fondest memory kind of thing? If we you can just say the MLS Cup or this Cup or that Open Cup, what can you say is your fondest memory from Kansas City that's not one of those? Not winning the championship was one of my fondest memories and not winning the championship. Not winning a cup, not MLS cup, not open cup. Probably just walking in that office every day with that staff. You know, it, it's people ask me about it all the time. You know, you spend eight years in a place going to work, grinding every day with our team admin, Rick Dressel, with Peter running the show, myself, Zavags, and Z, all arguing about what we think is the right thing to do with the team. Kenny Ishii and Mike Flaherty in the back, making sure that the guys are taken care of in terms of their kit and their, their health. And when you're going in every day and that same group of people is helping you move along and they're helping you grow and they're helping you grind it out. And you have some times that are crappy and you have some times that are great, you, you miss, you miss those times. My fondest memories are just, it's, it, it's just a blend of, of that day at work yeah. and all yeah. of the arguing and the hugging that led to all of that success. So what, I've got to tell you, Dad, one of the greatest experiences of my life was being involved with that organization. It helped me grow as a person. It helped me grow as a coach. And it made me realize this is where I want to be and what I want to be doing. I want to be leading soccer players and leading teams and try to build success and ideas and philosophies and, and ways of living through the game with like-minded people. They helped me, they helped me realize that. That's a, that's a great thing. I'll never forget them for that. That's, um, I've talked to a few players who have left the team uh, sometimes under less than positive circumstances. And I'm not going to name any names sure. in this regard. But every one of them that I've talked to, uh, whether it was on the record or off the record, is like, yeah, that organization, I wish I have not, I did not leave. Um, you know, I've not talked to one of them off the record or on the record that said, yeah, there's no way I would want to go back. And they all talked about how special it was. And, you know, um, and uh, like one former player that plays for an indoor team now told me about how he – he goes, that was a special place. And he goes, people don't always realize it when you're in that moment. But when it, you leave it, you realize it. Yeah. Well, it's so competitive. It's so hard driving. That, that will wear on you after a while, you know. But you also realize that that's where the growth happens. And that's where you make breakthroughs. You know, that's where you make revelations about yourself or about your group. So um, they've taught me. They've taught me so much. All right, so strange question number three or whatever I'm up to now. Okay. What's the stupidest question you ever got from media? What's the stupidest question I ever did got? Did I just ask it? <laughs> Probably. No, no, you didn't just ask it. Probably the stupidest question I've asked from media was after getting tossed from a game in Kansas City, I had, I had Peter, <laughs> Peter had asked me to walk down the sideline and say something to the AR, which I did, but I don't think any of us realized we used all our subs. So there was no reason why a coach needed to be outside of the box and walking down the sideline. So I was there just talking to the AR, me and him hanging out, having a conversation. And needless to say, I get tossed. And after the game, the reporter asked me, so what did you say? It's irrelevant, really, what I said. 
the point of the matter was I needed to say what I said and it was done and over and I got tossed for it. So I, you know, the dumbest question, most of the guys seem to, to do pretty good work. I mean, apart from stuff like that, where, you know, it's just some ridiculous, what did you say to him? Hell, I don't remember what I said to him. I was pissed off, you know, Lord knows what I said. And even if you did remember, you probably couldn't say it. Probably didn't want to repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> Very oh, true. So, yeah, to be honest, most of the press, I think, has been awesome. You know, we don't, in reality, we have it easy here in the, in the States. I, had, I played in Peru for a couple of years, and down there it's a little bit different. I know you can you see it all over Europe, oh, yeah. in America, the, the stuff that's written about players and coaches. So we have it, we have it fairly easy here. Maybe the, the most difficult piece is you're sometimes talking to people that don't understand the nuances of the game. They understand the game in general, but not some of the nuances. So you start to talk about those pieces, and it becomes a difficult conversation because you might have to explain it or teach it. But that's kind of fun in and of itself as well. Because that's really, I think, part of our job is to, to grow the game. Right. Yes, are, are, we, are we branding our team? Are we, are we wearing OKC Energy gear and we're branding Sporting Kansas City and all that? Yes. But we're also doing that for the game. People forget that, that people like myself and Peter Vermees grew up at a time where we as kids, when we went away to college, watched the old NASL with the Cosmos and Pelé, Canali, all those guys. We watched that league full. And many of us wondered to ourselves, hey, I thought that was a league I was going to play in. Well, what the hell do I do now? So it's so important that we make the game one that's a lasting one here. I never want to see that situation happen ever again in the U.S. where a league folds. So it's my job if a reporter who's, who's the beat writer for our team doesn't understand the game as well as he should, then it's our job to make sure that they do and to help educate him there. I think it, it's counterproductive to get irritated and frustrated with that person and not have a good relationship with them. You know, they're trying to do a job, you're trying to do a job, and I feel part of my job is to grow the game, which means I've got to make sure that I explain it to him in a way he understands it, and now he can write it or vlog it or blog it or whatever he does with it and gets it out there to the mainstream media and people so that we can have this game to hang on to forever. Yeah, I definitely remember those days with no soccer. So yeah, yeah. But I'm still I'm still a season ticket holder for Sporting Kansas City. I've been since day one. Good, good. And you should never stop doing that, regardless of whether you're covering them, not covering them. It's forget about the the, the conflict of interest thing. Have your tickets. Support the game. I've done the same in OKC. Yeah. You know, like it's it's just part of it. You know, it's just part of it. So people can call it stupid. People can call it whatever they want. That's just how I feel about the game. As long as I can afford them, we'll keep them. Mm -hmm. that, that's the question at this point. Um, yeah. That's all of us, my friend. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I do have an OKC Energy t-shirt. Do you? Yes. I got it when Jimmy was there. So and I, I'm going to ask it to you the side. What's that? <laughs> I'm going to ask you a difficult question. When are you going to make it out there for the first time to cover our team? I actually had I had a game picked out. sporting affiliate. I had a game picked out for this year, actually the main. Uh, I actually had a Minnesota, a sporting Minnesota game picked out because I was trying to get my daughter's coach to go to the Big Swans tournament up there. Yeah, it would have worked yeah. out to be like right around the same time, and they decided okay. not to take that age group up there, which I don't think is even happening now, probably. But probably not because um, my daughter's age group was getting. The last time that age group went up there, they were playing like the national team of Norway or something. Right. So they got killed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was literally like a 16 nothing game. Yeah. And that USA Cup that they do here has so many international teams. Yeah. Because we met so many of them last year working with, with Minnesota United. Yeah. When, when we went up there two years ago and um, the older team got destroyed, my daughter's team lost every game. But it was also a, a combination of like four teams put together because none of the teams had enough that wanted to go. Yeah. And they held their own. I mean, they, it was like three, two losses and things like that. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of fun playing international teams and teams from around the country and stuff like that. Right. You know? But it would have worked out perfectly to go to a, a Minnesota sporting game because it was right yeah. around that same week. We, yeah. Been, yeah, now that's not going to happen in either case. 
So I will promise you that when we can figure out a schedule, I will come <laughs> down there. Okay. And you will get me a press pass, right? Yes, I will. So I can I will come to the game. That, I will get you anything you need over there that's within my legal yeah. limits to be able to acquire. Oh, man, you had to put the legal limits part on it. Huh? <laughs> um, no, I, I promise you that if there's any way I can get down there this year, if not, I will for sure next year. This year is going to be really weird because once once the game starts going, you know, I anticipate there's going to be a lot of Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday kind of playing. Yeah. So, um, but, yeah, it's – so you got a place I can crash? Yeah, I get your place. No problem. <laughs> you stay in my place. I would, I would, I would expect that you'd have some good things to write at that point, but you know, <laughs> I scratch your back, you scratch mine, but that's, uh, you know, hey. yeah, we'd love to have you there. Thad, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of you. You can stay in my place. We can get you a hotel. We'll do whatever. No, 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 no. I wouldn't do that. If we're going to get coverage and we're going to grow the game and we're going to grow our brand, 100%, we'll make it worth your while. Press pass on a hot dog. Not okay. anything else beyond that. No, easy and good conversation the after the game. I bought the T-shirt. So, I mean, I'm not. I'm. I'm never asking the team for anything that is going to fade my coverage. So. Okay. All right, you're in. You're in. In any way you need it. But uh, actually, I need to see if the uh, if there's anybody covering OKC for SB Nation. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. They, they pretty much haven't – they have ones that cover USL teams, but some of the couple of the bigger ones. Right. And, you know, like we cover Slow Park, Sporting KC2 now. Right. Um, which uh, you guys weren't going to play this year, so. Correct, because they slid over to the Eastern Conference now. Yeah, which that's – we need to get that broken back into – so Kansas City can play St. Louis and OKC and yeah. any of the other teams. <laughs> I think the USL, I mean, I know MLS, they try to create the rivalries and it's important, but I think it's even more important in the USL where the crowds are smaller and those rivalries make a, a major difference. You know, if, if you have 4,000 people coming to a game, but you get 5,500 or 6,000 because it's a rivalry game, that's yeah. a, huge di it's a huge difference. You know what I'm talking about? So oh, yeah. I think that, that that's, that's important. We've got a good one going on with, with Tulsa. Um, nice little rivalry game going on that's in state there, but um, you know, they need to create those type of rivalries. And I think to be able to do that over time, USL may want to regionalize and have an East, a Central, and a West, because we all know that proximity breeds that, that rivalry. And so if we're in there with a, with a Swope Park or SKC2, it would make for a natural rivalry because they're right. one, of our, one of our closest teams. Tulsa would be another one, you know? Um, if FC Dallas is reserve team, uh, played in USL championship and not in USL one, I think that would be another great rivalry, you know, cause they're three hours away in one direction, sporting's four or five hours in the other direction would be, would be fantastic. We've got Tulsa two hours in the opposite direction. It's be great. Well, and that's the great thing about USL right now. I mean, I think they're up to 35 teams or somewhere around that mm -hmm. and it's more being added all the time. And then teams, USL one, USL two, yeah. um, which I really hate that naming standard. But anyway, um, nothing like copycatting somebody else. But yeah. anyway, USL has done such a great job of growing, uh, expanding, and having so many teams. And I, you know, if it wasn't for the entire world shutting down right now, I would anticipate even another 10, 15 teams over the next couple of years, just the way everything has been expanding. Yeah. So it would make sense to have, USL championship in three divisions or four divisions even. Yeah, yeah. I have to break, break it into divisions, not just the conferences, and then just go from there. And um, I know that USL, and again, I don't want you to run a bad spot, but USL has seemed to express a dislike for MLS two teams being in the USL championship. But you know, I, don't, I don't really know. I haven't had that discussion with our owner. Um, there are differences for sure between the independently. Now that I've had a chance to see both from both sides, they're, they're very different in terms of what their primary goals are. Yeah. If you take an SKC two, they're not trying to win the USL championship. If they do, they'd be ecstatic about it. Right. That's their goal. Their goal is to, to bridge the gap between their academy or kids coming home from college and that first team. 
And it has done an they've done an unbelievable job with that, of being able to bridge that gap. Whereas independent teams, for the most part, are more concerned about trying to win the whole thing. And so are there, are there deviations from that? Of course, you have independent teams that just want to participate and continue to be involved, really don't have any aspirations to be big time champions. And you've got some teams like RSL last year, super successful. It's a two team and that ended up winning the, uh, the championship, you know? The other we'll, thing- we'll, we'll Park went to the finals the first two years. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And, and the thing that you, um, I think maybe some clubs, USL clubs don't like is, they might see it as a competitive advantage for the, the teams that are, are sponsored by or affiliated with MLS teams to have players that, that drip down into that team. And so they're, they're dealing with players that maybe are a little bit higher standard than what they would normally play against. But the flip side of that is oftentimes when those players bleed down from the first team into the reserve teams and play in the USL team, they sometimes make that team that they're playing for a little more disjointed right. because they're normally with that group. So it, there's, there's positives and negatives, and, and we can bitch and moan about all that stuff, but at the end of the day, we're competing. Go out, shut your mouth, compete, let's fight like dogs and see who wins. But that's just my, my perspective and my opinion on it. I'm pretty sure when uh, the couple times that sporting has loaned a large number of players down at one time because of just wanting to get some guys time to – be prepared for an open cup game or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, Swap Park actually played much worse. Yeah. Because um, you lose continuity. Yeah. And one of the games, um, I mean, the, I want to say they had like eight loanies down that would not have normally played. Seven or eight loanies that would not have played with Swap Park. Some, because there's some that are there pretty much all the time anyway. Right. And Paul was one of them. Naga, he was one of those guys that the first year was loaned down. Probably coming back from injury. Yeah. yeah. And they, Quite honestly, they sucked that game. And it was it just sucked for the guys who played for Swill Park sitting there watching their their team not play well because the the first team came down. Right. Yeah. And those, those first team guys were really worried, not about winning the game, but about themselves and getting themselves into the type of fitness and shape that they yeah. need to be ready to play for the first team. And make sure you don't get injured and stay safe and healthy so that you can play for the first team. So now you're not taking as many risks. There's, so I say there's arguments on both sides of the fence about the, the USL thing and learning those players down. At the end of the day, they blow the whistle, compete. It's 11 v 11, let's go. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've never obviously played at that level, but I've never stepped into a game and, the, and said, yeah, I'm not gonna try, you know? It's, <laughs> right. once, once the game goes, it's like, you, it just, you forget about it and you just play. Right, yeah. Um, in fact, I think the only game that I really didn't care about trying in, I got my arm broke. Yeah, well, there you go. If you're going to compete, you better compete. Otherwise, you're going to end up in the hospital. It was, uh, it was an indoor game on a holiday, and they just like put it together, a house team kind of thing, and we all had to take our turn in goal. Two minutes left in the game, I fall down and pick up a ball. A guy runs up, kicks me in the arm. Hey. Exactly where it was broke, right there. It's not as easy as it looks to be in the goal, is it? I was not happy about it. I was actually mad at the ref because he gave him the goal. Ah. Did you have was, possession? Yes. Did they have VAR at the time? No. Oh, man. Just, no. I mean, VAR is solving everything, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. <laughs> I actually do like VAR, but yeah, it sometimes the – I think MLS has actually done it better than England has, and mm -hmm. there is still questions about why this was chosen and this wasn't chosen. Yeah, almost one of those. I almost do want the the calling of the VAR to go to central site, and it could be the same guys calling it. But then you have to have a when you have a lot of games going on, that makes it harder. So. Yeah, that's the thing. I the one thing I wish they would do is just take it once it gets to that point take it out of the hands of the referee that's on the field. Just if you've seen something on the video that looks clearly to be a problem, yeah. then they should just buzz into his ear and say, hey, listen, this is what happened, and remove the referee that's on the field from, from that decision. You know? And I think that speeds it up as well. Yep. You, don't have, you don't have the guy listening and listening and listening and listening some more, and then he's got to walk over and he's got to look at the screen. Have the guy upstairs help make a decision based on the replays. Find the replays very quickly. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Boom, done. This is what we're doing. 
And so it's almost well, like easy you know, for you, me to say from here. Oh yeah. It's uh it's kinda like that whole sub situation now, you know, they always you always sub the guys on the far end of the field, right? To make them do the long walk back. So they've changed that rule now, so you just sub yeah. off. Well, it seems like the VAR issue was always like in the corner of the field opposite of wherever the TV screen was. So the yeah. ref would have to do the long, slow jog over there, look at it, and then do the long, slow jog back, and then make a symbol. Right. Instead of the, yeah. Yeah. If they can speed that up. They'll, they'll work on the process, and they'll make it better and better over time. So it's got to start somewhere. Unfortunately, we're at the front end of it. Um, so we're dealing with that, that piece of the experimentation. but. It'll, uh, you know, again, it, it takes all of us to make the game work. So it takes the officials, it takes the fans, it takes the media, it takes the coaches, it takes the players, it takes all these, it takes the ownership groups because you can't do it without the money. Um, all those things have to work together for the game. So slowly but surely, they'll get it right. And, 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 and to be fair and honest, I will very rarely criticize a referee in writing. I will maybe sometimes curse them going, oh, that was a stupid call or that sucked. But I even try not to do that because I know how many times I've thought that and then went looked at the replay and went, okay. I <laughs> or I see why they called it. <laughs> That's not 100%. Though. Yeah. Definitely yeah. Some, some ones. I just want consistency. That's yeah. really all I want. Yeah. I'd like the rep to be, be consistent across the league for the most part. Right. That's, that's a tough one, Thad. You know, it's, and, and I don't know why that is, but my feeling is that just like our country is, is a melting pot and so diverse, when you look at our referee pool throughout the USL and um, MLS, you have the same thing. You have, you have cultural differences in the players and you have it in the referees as well. Yeah. So when, you, when the referees referee in one way, shape or form because of the cultural differences based on a guy has a little bit more of a, a South American style, but he's obviously has some Colombian background or Mexican background or, or whatever. He's going to be influenced that way because that's the way he grew up watching and loving the game. So there are certain types of fouls that are going to get called more often from that referee than one who grew up watching the game in a different cultural setting. And so we don't have a uniform way of seeing the game. Not as fans, not as players, not as coaches, not as referees. And it's, it's one of the difficulties we have here in the, in the U.S. And that's why I think you see a little bit of a, a lack of consistency from one referee to the next. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And in some cases, I think that diversity is a, a really benefit to the, the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like U.S. soccer was trying to sometimes say the development academy should all coach to these certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sporting wants to coach their players to be possession-based and speedy, or, you know, maybe Salt Lake wants to coach their players to be big, strong, and foul a lot. Um, you know, whatever, whatever, choose they, whatever they choose, but that provides a pool that the next head coach can go, hey, I'm going to play this style. I'm pulling in these players. I'm going to play this yeah. style. I'm going to pull in those players and have some options. Yeah. So I think in those aspects, it's really good. I just, just want calls to be the same, man. Yeah, yeah. You and me too. You and me both. You and me both, my friend. Balls and strikes. They're in the zone or they're not. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, anyway, I, I know I've taken a lot of your time, so I really appreciate it. Hey, Thad, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been great catching up. I love talking. I really enjoy talking about sport in Kansas City. Like I said, it was eight great years of my life that yeah. helped put me on this path. They were the first ones to give me this opportunity to coach professionally. And I will always thank them and, and Peter for that. Uh, and it's, it's led to where I am today and anything else I do in the game. So um, I've met you in that process through them um, and, and really enjoyed the relationship. And, and I thank you for allowing me the time to, to chat with you on here. We get to, to talk to people and catch up again. Yeah, my pleasure. And, you know, right now we're not getting to talk enough soccer anyway, so anything is good. Yeah. Um, hopefully maybe I can catch up with you again in a couple months when the league is going and you have some results and you can say, yes, we've been doing great, or here's who I'm going to fire. Or <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that, but um, yeah. so we can do a little catch up and I will make a game if I can make it at all this year. Great. 
Great. Yeah, let's keep the lines of communication more open than they've been the last couple of years. But I cannot wear an OKC shirt if I'm there. Okay. I, you, did you ever see me wear sporting stuff? Um, I don't really recall, to be honest with you. Never. Never, huh? Nope. Well, it's good. It, 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 listen, you're, you're probably not impartial because it's probably part of your heart and your brain that resides with the organization. Oh, yes. But, but you're aware of that and self-aware enough to know, hey, listen, this is the job. This is where you draw the line. Today, I'm doing my work. Today, I'm not the fan. Today, I am the, the reporter. I truly believe that I can be rooting for the team to do well but be objective as to how they played. I want player X to score that goal. Do I think maybe he's the best player for that spot? Maybe not, right? right. But I can, I can do that. Um, one of the hardest things was after a tough loss at home, to walk into the media room and have some reporter go, hey, did you see the result in Dallas? F you. <laughs> <laughs> what did you care about the result in Dallas? You only cared about this one. I, I'm sitting, you know, I'm sitting as close to that field as you guys were. I'm rooting for that team as much as you guys were. I'm still being doing my job and trying to shoot to get the mm -hmm. photos and all that type of stuff. But I'm, I'm involved in that game as close as anybody could possibly be that's not a player. And then somebody goes, did you see what happened in Dallas? Yeah. I almost hit that guy several times. Yeah. Yeah. He's always the same guy. Yeah. Not going to yeah. mention him. I won't ask who it was. Uh, he's not a bad guy. It's just yeah. a totally different perspective than what I had. I was like, sure. Yeah, he's doing his job. He's not a fan. That's, he's doing his job. He looks at it as his job. You look at it as a passion. Ultimately, you're going to – I don't know if you are now or not, but ultimately you're going to be better than that person because you're passionate about what you do. The other guy looks at it as his job. Yeah, well – We'll discuss this more when I'm not recording. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, again, thanks for the time. And.